Well, today we're going to learn about the light of Christ gospel. And I'll be reading the scripture from the second epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we, could, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Here ends the reading. So we're going to hang out a little bit here today on the seventh verse, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. In that verse, we see treasure jars of clay and surpassing power. What is the treasure that is being spoken of here? Let's pause at this point. We didn't pray before we started. We prayed earlier. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, guide and direct the presentation of your word because we are totally dependent upon your Holy Spirit. Get your will done in our words and in our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. The treasure. Verse 6 of what we just read says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts. Now this is the same God who said, let there be light. Back in, recorded for us back in the book of Genesis. Same God that said, let there be light and created light, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. The glory of God, the fullness, the beauty of God in the face of Jesus. Now let's add to that Colossians 1.27. The riches of the glory of this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 2, 2 and 3. The knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So take Christ. Last week we talked about how beautiful he is, how good he is, how he is the fullness of all the good things that are God. Take all of this. See the glory of God in the face of Jesus. See all that God has done in Jesus. Go back. The song that we just sang referred to this verse in Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Add that into the mix. Take it all. All that we have in Jesus, that's the treasure. That's the pearl of great price. That is this valuable treasure that God has seen fit to put into <laughs> us. 
that is kind of like almost a contradiction, isn't it? Why would you put something so awesome in something so vulnerable? So that's the treasure. And if you want to boil it all down to this, just remember the treasure is Jesus. The treasure is Christ our Lord and all that he is. And he's put that treasure in clay jars. Clay jars are fragile. They're flawed. They're vulnerable. They're not really able to protect their treasures. Now, one of the more um, recent and well-known treasures that has come to us from clay jars is the, um, the collection of scrolls over in the Middle East, the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was been a number of decades now. And these scrolls have been a real treasure. They've been invaluable. And they were found in a cave in a bunch of clay jars. But the clay jars didn't really protect them because they were fragmented and they've had to be pieced together like puzzles and there's still some pieces that won't all fit together. Part of what protected them was the dry climate and part of what protected them to a point was the clay jars. But that was limited because clay jars are fragile and they're vulnerable. Well, when Paul says here, the treasure is in jars of clay, he's really not talking about clay jars, is he? He's talking about us. Christians are fragile, flawed, and vulnerable. You and me, we're fragile, flawed, and vulnerable. That's why it's almost preposterous to think that God would make us vessels of his treasure. But he does. That's what's so beautiful about this whole message. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you've heard anything on the entertainment, through the entertainment media, especially in romantic movies, and some of us Christians watch the Hallmark Channel because it's clean. It may be dorky in a thousand ways, but it's clean. But what is the message we get there and in a lot of other places? You've got to follow your heart. Over and over and over again, just follow your heart. You can't go wrong if you follow your heart. May I please, please say to you, and will you please, please hear it, that is not true. That is a lie. That is the lie of the enemy. Because God says what we just read. The heart is deceitful and desperately sick. We are a fallen people. We're clay jars. We're cracked. We're cracked pots, if you will. <laughs> Somebody... Somebody already wrote a book about that, so I just, it's just the truth. We're, we're flawed by sin. Romans 7, 18 and 19, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, in my cracked pot. For I have the desire to do what is right, but am not able to carry it out. I don't have the ability to carry it out. Because I'm flawed, I'm human, I'm a, I'm a fallen creature. We're, we're sinful by nature. So, this power of God 
that we're talking about has been given to us even though we're flawed. Okay? So, the treasure, the clay jars. But now, let's look at the surpassing power. To show, he puts this treasure in, in us who are flawed because he wants us to see and understand that the power to be godly is not in us. It's not about us. The power is in him, our God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You just kind of can't help but go back in your mind to, to uh, Judges chapter 6, where God calls Gideon to deliver the Hebrews from the Midianites, and they round up 30,000 men, and God says, well, that's too many. Get rid of them. So he pairs down the whole story. You have to read it in, in Judges chapter 6. He finally pairs down Gideon's army to 300. Well, that's ridiculous, of course. But God makes it very clear. I want the Israelites to understand that it wasn't their own strength and their own power that delivered them. I want them to understand that their deliverance was from me. That's exactly what Paul's saying here. I want you to understand that the power to live for God is not in yourselves, not in us. It's in him. <clears throat> okay. That the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The word surpassing, fun word. The word surpassing is hyperbole. It means hooper is beyond. Bole means to throw. You know, kind of like roll the bowl, the ball. Bole. That word, hooper bole, and the, and the whole phrase is hooper bole tes dunameos. Now, I am not a Greek scholar, so that's the best you're going to get. But we have literally used that word. There are a few words that come from the Greek and the Latin to our language, and we haven't even changed them. We just use them. And this is one of them. And we pronounce it hyperbole. Or, uh, yeah, hyperbole. Now we take the, the, the H-U-P-E-R, we, we change the U to a Y, and we call it hyper. And we're all familiar with hyper. We use hyper with a lot of things. It means above and beyond. So hyperbole simply means above and beyond. But we have used it in the English as a literary device of extravagant exaggeration. It's raining cats and dogs. No, it's not raining cats and dogs. That's, a, that's an extreme exaggeration to make a point. Or, boy, it's just a flood out there. No, it's just it's a hard summer shower. Okay? But we, that's hyperbole. Or one that we use more than any any others, I think. I'm starving. <laughs> you're, not, you're not starving. You're at least 40 days away from starving. <laughs> well, that's hyperbole. And that's why I've called the message hyperbole not. Because this granddaddy of, I, of our word hyperbole is used here to say the surpassing power of God. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, and here I've used the Holman translation because I like, I like the way it says it. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond, above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in you. We read that. Many of the translations say immeasurably more. The King James, I think, said exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. 
And it's so easy in our minds to relegate a statement like that to hyperbole. Kind of like an extreme statement. Yeah, I hear it. Yeah, above and beyond. Anything I can imagine. Yeah, right, I hear it. Okay, that, that makes a point that God can do a whole lot. No. We are the ones that have changed the meaning of the word into an extreme exaggeration. But when God says it, it ain't hyperbole. It's the truth. When God says surpassing power, he means surpassing power. When God says extremely above and beyond anything you can ask or think, that's exactly what God means. Now, the next word is power, surpassing power. This is a form of the word dunamis, which we all have become familiar with. It's power. The word dynamite was taken from it. But this is the word power that means to actually achieve what it sets out to do. There's another word that's used in, in the original, iscus, and it means strength or the ability. But that word stresses the ability, not necessarily the accomplishment. God's power is accomplishing power. It actually does it, follows through with the reality, and does what God promises. Ephesians 1.19, the immeasurable greatness of his power, accomplishing power, toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. We're talking about the power of God in flawed human beings the treasure at work in our cracked pots. Demonstrated, proven, achieving power that is at work in you and me. And Ephesians 1.19 just breaks right on in to 1.20 that he, the power, his great might, verse 19, verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now, with that in mind, remember Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, the context of Romans 8 is not the resurrection at the end of days. The context of Revelation, uh, 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 pardon me, Romans 8 is moral victory, spiritual victory in the here and now. So what Romans 8, 11 is saying, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will take these cracked clay jars, these broken, vulnerable, fragile beings that you are, and he will make you to live as unto Christ and live a life of victory in Christ. That's the surpassing power that we're talking about. Now, Story time. I got to get this right because I can't pronounce it. Maria Oktyabriskaya. That's as good as it's going to get, too. If you can do better, you go right ahead. Maria was a telephone operator. She was the wife of a Soviet army officer and the proud owner of a T-34 tank. Which, with which she killed enough Nazis in World War II to earn her the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. After the outbreak of the war, Maria was evacuated to Siberia while her husband went off to fight. He was killed almost immediately, and she didn't get to hear about it until two years later. She is driven by rage, and with nothing 
left to lose from her point of view. She sold her house and belongings and bought a T-34 tank, which she donated to the Soviet Union under the condition that she be, one, be the one that, to drive it. Her unit, to which she was assigned, was skeptical. But their opinions changed after the first battle in which she eliminated numbers of machine gun nests, artillery guns, the Nazis who manned them. When her tank was hit and immobilized by heavy enemy fire, she immediately jumped out to repair it. She was promoted to sergeant for her act of heroism. Maria was not killed until a battle near the village of Shvedi in 1944. She did not, however, die before eliminating several machine gun nests, trenches, a self-propelled gun, and yet more Nazis for good measure. I would not in any way malign this lady. She was courageous. She fought valiantly. She undoubtedly deserved the right to be called a hero. We do know, however, that she was driven by rage and revenge. Her story is in a series of articles on the greatest acts of revenge from grunge.com. That's the kind of power that we tend to gravitate to in our natural frame of mind. And the tragedy is that Maria never found healing for her heart in all that she accomplished in the natural. The power that God gives us is not the power to destroy. It's the power to forgive and to heal. There is no amount of human power, either destructive or constructive. When you stand in a, in a, in a large city, you know, even, a, even as small a large city as Jacksonville, and look up at the high-rise buildings, it's kind of a marvel how mankind can build such things. But it's not that kind of power, either constructive or destructive, that can heal a heart. There is no amount of power, money, accomplishment in the realm of humanity that can heal a wounded heart. That requires the power of God. So when we talk, as we are in this passage of Scripture, about the surpassing power that belongs to God and not to us, the power that can do above and beyond what we can ask or think, we're not talking about creative power, although God is the creator. We're not talking about destructive power, although God can destroy his enemies. We're talking about the power to redeem a life. We're talking about the power of the gospel. Back in the 1950s, a story broke that most of us, if not all of us, have heard and maybe know well. A movie was made about it. And five young men took their airplane, landed on a beach in order to share the gospel in Ecuador with some of the native tribes. They were killed that day. They did have at their disposal firearms. They had committed not to use those firearms because they knew they were ready to enter into the presence of God and the people they were seeking to reach were not. And so it looked as though they were powerless. And yet because of their commitment their families went back and those same, that same tribe became a tribe of believers where most, if not all, 
of them came to Christ and will share eternity together in the kingdom of God with them. That's the power we're talking about. So when we say the surpassing power of God, immeasurably above all that we can ask or think, we're not talking hyperbole here. We're talking reality. But neither are we talking about destructive or even constructive power in the natural. We're talking about the power of God to transform a life, and you don't get that anywhere else but in Jesus. Someday you may have already or yet have the opportunity to say to a coworker, a friend, a child, a relative, you may have the opportunity to say to them, could you imagine what it would be like to have every sin you have ever committed in your life completely forgiven? You can share that because you've already experienced that. What amount of money would that cost? What amount of power would that require? Nothing that we have in our human lives. Nothing at all. But the all-surpassing power of the God who saves us. Power for what? Power to forgive. Power to rescue and provide what we need in deliverance from the power of sin. Anyone who's ever struggled with addiction on any level knows how much of a grip sin can get a hold of your life and dominate you. We're talking about the power to heal. What Maria really needed was not a T-34 tank. She needed healing in her heart, grief and sorrow, the need for revenge is, is just prevalent in our world. It's, it's a part of the human condition, but Jesus can bring healing to that need. And then, of course, there's all of God's promises of what is yet to come that can only be accomplished by his purposes. It looks like our world is pretty well ready for the trash can, isn't it? I mean, folks just can't stop fighting all over the world. What in the world is the matter with us? Well, we know what's the matter with us. It's not a social problem. It's not an ethnic problem. It's a sin problem. But God's got a plan. And he's working out that plan in you and me, in the lives of individuals promising us that he's got something to, for us to look forward to that no amount of human effort can conjure up. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Oh God, help us today to experience and lean heavily upon the surpassing power of God who works in us each and every day. In Christ's name we pray.